Hey everyone, welcome to the Peter Atia Drive. I'm your host, Peter Atia. The drive is a result of my hunger for optimizing performance, health, longevity, critical thinking, along with a few other obsessions along the way. I've spent the last several years working with some of the most successful top performing individuals in the world. And this podcast is my attempt to synthesize what I've learned along the way to help you live a higher quality, more fulfilling life. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at peteratiamd.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The Drive. I'd like to take a couple of minutes to talk about why we don't run ads on this podcast. If you're listening to this, you probably already know. But the two things I care most about professionally are how to live longer and how to live better. I have a complete fascination and obsession with this topic. I practice it professionally, and I've seen firsthand how access to information is basically all people need to make better decisions and improve the quality of their lives. Curating and sharing this knowledge is not easy, and even before starting the podcast, that became clear to me. The sheer volume of material published in this space is overwhelming. I'm fortunate to have a great team that helps me continue learning and sharing this information with you. To take one example, our show notes are in a league of their own. In fact, we now have a full-time person that is dedicated to producing those, and the feedback has mirrored this. So all of this raises a natural question. How will we continue to fund the work necessary to support this? As you probably know, the tried and true way to do this is to sell ads. But after a lot of contemplation, that model just doesn't feel right to me for a few reasons. Now, the first and most important of these is trust. I'm not sure how you could trust me if I'm telling you about something when you know I'm being paid by the company that makes it to tell you about it. Another reason selling ads doesn't feel right to me is because I, I I just know myself. I have a really hard time advocating for something that I'm not absolutely nuts for. So if I don't feel that way about something, I don't know how I can talk about it enthusiastically. So instead of selling ads, I've chosen to do what a handful of others have proved can work over time. And that is to create a subscriber model for my audience. This keeps my relationship with you both simple and honest. If you value what I'm doing, you can become a member In exchange, you'll get the benefits above and beyond what's available for free. It's that simple. It's my goal to ensure that no matter what level you choose to support us at, you will get back more than you give. So, for example, members will receive full access to the exclusive show notes, including other things that we plan to build upon. These are useful beyond just the podcast, especially given the technical nature of many of our shows. Members also get exclusive access to listen to and participate in the regular Ask Me Anything episodes. That means asking questions directly into the AMA portal and also getting to hear these podcasts when they come out. Lastly, and this is something I'm really excited about, I want my supporters to get the best deals possible on the products that I love. And as I said, we're not taking ad dollars from anyone, but instead what I'd like to do is work with companies who make the products that I already love and would already talk about for free and have them pass savings on to you. Again, the podcast will remain free to all, but my hope is that many of you will find enough value in, one, the podcast itself, and two, the additional content exclusive for members. I want to thank you for taking a moment to listen to this. If you learn from and find value in the content I produce, please consider supporting us directly by signing up for a monthly subscription. My guest this week is Kyle Kingsbury. Some of you may recognize Kyle. He's a retired UFC fighter. He's been on the Joe Rogan experience a number of times. He's currently the director of human optimization at Onnit. I first met Kyle in person during a hunting trip in early 2019, though we had both known sort of about each other prior to that and seen each other in interviews and things like that. So we immediately clicked and become very close since that time. Now, in this episode, which truthfully, you know, when you're interviewing people that you know pretty well, you don't really know where you're going to go. And honestly, this episode and this interview went in places I did not expect it to go in and for which I'm incredibly grateful. We could have spent a lot of this time talking about 
UFC and mixed martial arts and all of those things. And, and that would have been interesting. But we went to places that Kyle has never talked about publicly. In fact, a couple of things that he hadn't even shared with me privately before. So I was incredibly moved by this experience. So, you know, we talk about his upbringing, playing football, going to JC, then college. We talk about his experience with performance enhancing drugs, something I don't think he's ever really spoken about before. As a little sidebar, we talk about something called the Wizinator, which is about the funniest thing I've ever heard of. Talk about his transition away from football after realizing he wasn't going to make it to the NFL. And it's during this piece that Kyle really opens up about this period of depression in his life and his thoughts of suicide that have been somewhat recurrent and had started as early as you know the age of seven. He talks about his close calls with suicide, his eventual transition into MMA and UFC. And we, we end our talk with a, a conversation around his experience with ayahuasca towards the end of his UFC career and how that really became the turning point in his own journey towards being sort of more emotionally healthy and frankly, what's enabled him to become a father and become the father that he wishes, you know, he could have had. Now, before we get into this conversation, I feel it's really important to have a couple of disclaimers. First, in this conversation, Kyle really opens up about his past depression and his thoughts of suicide and how close he was to it on a number of occasions. This is a very heavy conversation. And if you're currently experiencing any thoughts of self-harm or suicide, it is imperative that you seek out medical help immediately. Second, Kyle and I have a very open and honest conversation about psychedelics. The substances we speak about are illegal, and by no means are we advocating for anyone to use them or experiment with them. There are physical, physiological, psychological, and legal risks around the use of these plants. This conversation is purely informational only. Kyle speaks about his personal experiences and how it has shaped his thinking. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with my friend Kyle Kingsbury. Hi, right, brother. How are you? I'm doing great, brother. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Thank you. I forgot it was Father's Day when I woke up and my wife left me this beautiful little note on the counter. She had gone out running before I got up and it was like, here's your coffee. It was like, it was like the sweetest thing. What did you do for Father's Day today? Because you're not with your boy. No, we, we head back tomorrow to the Bay and we'll get like a Father's Day celebration there. My dad's going to come up from Santa Cruz. So today is just living the dream. I mean, I'm on your podcast. I'm staying at your house. We're going to shoot arrows after this with a couple other great guys. So couldn't ask for much more. So did you grow up in Santa Cruz or San Jose? Right outside San Jose in Cupertino and Sunnyvale. Got it. And you played a ton of sports growing up, I imagine. Was football your big one? Yeah, I wasn't really good. I mean, I got into baseball late, 12. A lot of kids have been playing for a long time. So I just played one year. Football I got into at 10. And I just loved it immediately. Like I was playing at that point, you had weight classes and age classes. So for my weight and age, it was, I think, I don't know, right around 105 to 110 pounds when I was 10. Wow, so I was skinny cute. like a bean pole. I mean, then that strikes every, me as big for a 10 year old, but maybe I'm just comparing you to my daughter. I don't know. At 12, which is not a good comparison. Maybe, maybe it was less, but at 12, we were on the Sunnyvale Micro Rockets. That was 118 because I remember that was the last year I could play. We had a running back that weighed the same weight. We both had to cut weight and he was a great deal shorter than me. So he was just stacked. I didn't fill out till much later, like sophomore year of high school. That's interesting. Kids at 12 cutting weight. Yeah. I'm not sure that's great. We'd get the seeds or something like that that are salted and just suck and spit for, for hours, you know, on the drive out to games, that kind of stuff. So in high school, you played football, football and wrestling in junior high and high school. Got it. So how'd you decide where you wanted to go for college? You know, I had for a long time wanted to play in the Pac-10. It used to be the Pac-10. I think every kid wants to get out of state when they go. A lot of them want to get out of state when they go to university, as you call it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to go too far, obviously. Your parents will throw a fit. My parents would have. But a lot of my good friends that I grew up with, I knew since I was 12 years old, they were like, dude, we're going to ASU. It's amazing. And I had to go to junior college because I was garbage, garbage academically. I didn't resonate a lot with the teachers I had. And, you know, we talked about this on my podcast yesterday. Literally, I can count on one hand everyone that stuck out and took me under their wing and saw something in me that more than I saw myself. So going to junior college, I went for one year and then I realized I can, if I transfer to a different junior college that's right by ASU, my likelihood of getting in is much higher. So that's what I did. So why do you think that is, by the way, that high school didn't resonate? We had a pretty high academic school for a public school. The Wall Street Journal published us as one of the top 10 public schools in, in the world. 
And we had a lot of people from China and Asia and India coming over. It's even higher now. It's about, I want to say 70 to 80% Asian, including Indian. And the population is what roughly of the high school? It was huge. I mean, I think we had 2,500 people in our graduating class senior year. 25. So wait, wait, you mean there were 10,000 kids in the entire high school? I don't think so. Maybe that's the wrong number. 2,500 total probably. Okay. Yeah. Couldn't have been 10,000. Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, regardless, being, that's still unbelievable. They couldn't build whatever the portables, they couldn't get enough portables one year. So we had breached the number that was allowed in the school district and the superintendent gave it an okay because his son went to school with us. In a high school that big, you don't actually know everybody in your class. No, there's, there's, I mean, many, many kids that I didn't know from that, but we kind of, I mean, like any high school, you stick to your core group, that kind of thing. And I was fortunate enough to have those guys all the way through college and, and after I'm still close with a lot of them. I mean, obviously knowing you today, you're intellectually curious and, you know, thoughtful and stuff, but yeah, I always find it interesting when you see people who have kind of gone through a transformation of not resonating with any of that stuff until doing so. But I often wonder, like, was there a precipitating event? Was there a bad experience you had with a teacher or something like that? You know, I wasn't nice in high school if I, or, or prior to that. I got in trouble from kindergarten on. I'd get sent to the principal's office at least three days a week. Got in a lot of fights growing up. I mean, more than the fighting, just mess with the teachers. You know, I was a class clown and pretty disruptive. And I enjoyed that. It gave me some sense of control in, in my environment. I always enjoyed entertaining people and making people laugh. So like that checks off every box. If I can start riffing and clowning on people and everyone's laughing and looking at me, then I can get a little attention and maybe be a, you know, a little bit of a jerk to the teacher, but it was worth it to me. So it was actually at ASU. I was taking some psychology courses and sociology and communication where I was like, oh, this shit matters. Like I will, it doesn't matter if I get a philosophy degree or a communications degree, like this is th these are things that I will use the rest of my life. And that was the first time where it really felt that way. You know, a lot of kids complain like, what am I going to use algebra for? What am I going to use this for? You know, and, and I think that having that in college really made me think like, oh, there's a lot to learn. And it's, there's really cool stuff to learn that resonates with me. And in all those classes, I did really well. It was all A's and, I mean, A's and B's as well for me. So. so it's interesting because if it weren't for football, I mean, you jumped through a lot of hoops to get to ASU. You're going to JC's before you get there, right? And a walk on at ASU. Okay. So it begs the question, right? If you weren't athletic, if you were the exact same guy, but you didn't happen to have a ability to play, you know, division one football, what would you have done after high school? Something blue collar for sure. My dad, he had a uh, Silicon Valley shelving was a company he created in the Bay right as the tech boom started. And all these tech companies needed static control shelving. So he was making a lot of money and he would pay me and my sister to build a lot of this stuff. And it was fun for me. It was like giant erector sets, you know, like we'd, we'd play with uh, it's like life-size Lego. Yeah. Huge stuff. Even, you know, like we'd get into a warehouse and he and I would be drilling into concrete and pounding, you know, giant hammers down to get this stuff anchored. And, and that was always cool and it paid really well, but I enjoyed it. So I liked working with my hands there and he came from a different era, you know, as every dad is, but, um, he always worked on cars and he knew a lot about things. And then he would kind of shun me from living the same life as him. He was like, no, you're going to go into sales. You're going to make a ton of money. You'll just pay a guy to work on your car. You just pay a guy to fix your house. Cause he did all that. He did construction since he was 20. And I was just laughed at it. It was like, these are like really usable skills. It's nice to know how to ch change the oil in your car. You know, <laughs> like, why aren't you teaching me this stuff? So thankfully now he's kind of, that have had a little bit of success. He's, he's happy to show me those things. Why do you think he felt that way? Where did Jed grow up? Did he grow up in the same area? He grew up in all my families from Oregon in the Pacific Northwest. And then they moved to California. My parents met in Alaska and then moved to California. I think in large part to, to be by the sun and to get away from their families. And so, you know, I, I grew up there and I just think all parents want better for their kids, you know, in that regard. And he saw that as better, you know, financial success, stability, those kind of things as better. And were they upset then in high school when you weren't doing well academically? Kind of. I mean, they paid attention and I'd get in trouble a lot at home. I think for them, it was really hard to kind of wrap their brain around how you can wrangle someone in at that point because... You know, they fought a lot growing up. I talked about this before, but one of the books that I really have a lot of love for is Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, who recently passed away. And whatever that is, 
my childhood was not. So they really didn't know how to communicate with one another. And it was like two Rams butting heads all the time. And then they got divorced when I was 13. And from there, that was like the deepest sense of peace I'd ever had because it was less stress on both of them. They didn't know how to communicate with each other. And did you and your sister spend time with both of them? Or you pretty much we, my mom got one. full custody, but we'd see my dad every week, you know, twice a week, something like that. And he was still a big part of our lives and he lived right down the street. So, and I wanted to see him more because he was a gentler, kinder dad at that point. Was one of your parents more strict than the other when it came to trying to keep you in line at school? I'd say I went back and forth, you know, on who took the cake there. You know, they, they had different, different ways of discipline, but yeah, it was, I don't know. I think they were at a loss really, but they still, they never said, you're not going to go to college. Like the entire time it was, you're still going to college. I don't give a shit. If you have to go to junior college for three years, you're going to go to college. So they were pretty pumped when I got into ASU, which is funny. There was a Simpsons episode where there's the great flood and Ned Flanders is <laughs> like, thank you, Lord. You've spared the righteous and damned the wicked. And he sees Homer floating in a raft and he's like, looks like heaven's easier to get into than Arizona state. <laughs> We played that clip all through college. Like it was, it was great. It was a feather in our cap. But yeah, it is, it is an easy school to get into. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, it's a school that also has a great reputation as well. You get in there and, and what ASU's got to be huge. It was massive. It was still, I mean, still to this day. And even at that point when I was there, one of the high, most highly populated schools in the country. Huge campus, gorgeous campus, hot year round for the most part. And, you know, the draw for a young male is that a lot of the ladies there, they can't wear much. They can't hide it, you know, because of the heat. And um, that was, that was definitely, there were some good times there for sure. So you walked on Mm -hmm. and what position do you play? I was defensive end and defensive tackle. I was probably, not probably, I was for sure undersized to play D tackle, but too slow to play D end. So it's kind of an in-betweener. And thankfully, you were talking about these great teachers that you've had. One of them was my strength and conditioning coach. Actually, both strength and conditioning coaches I had at Arizona State went on to become strength and conditioning coaches in the NFL. And the head of the strength and conditioning department, this guy named Joe Ken, Big House Power is uh, kind of his moniker now, or it was then too, but Big House, he's the only guy in Division One football history and the NFL to win strength coach of the year in both Division One football and the NFL. And he's the coach. He's the strength coach for the Carolina Panthers. Mark Uyama, he was, he went on to become the head strength coach for the 49ers. He's, I think he's now with the Vikings. And both those guys really pushed me past whatever limit I thought I had. You know, like if there's a ceiling, they would push me so far past that. I just began to realize like there is no ceiling. And you were how old when you showed up? You're two years young, older than the other. Yeah, I think I was 20. Yeah, it was definitely a, an impressionable time. And I was still working through a lot, not really knowing how, you know, drinking a lot, doing the party thing. We were number one party school in the nation. If that's any claim to fame, I I know know, one of of my friends at med school went to ASU and the stories he told were, I mean, I couldn't, I I couldn't fathom what he was talking about. I mean, I was sort of like, he was speaking another language. I was like, (laughs) what did you guys actually do? Was my, well, I mean, I can give one example. They filmed a porno at one of the fraternities that my friends all went to Theta Chi and they actually shut down all fraternities. Like they don't exist there anymore because of that. So there, I mean, there was, there was no extreme you couldn't think of that, that didn't happen there. I mean, it was really, it was wild and fun and I've lost some friends to drug overdoses and many, you know, it was polarized for sure. You know, and there were still people that went there that were, you know, on the grind and they had all their ducks in a row. But I think there was a lot more people just exploring what it felt like to be an adult for the first time. Did you sort of think about this at the time? Like I'm escaping from something, I'm running from something, or did you feel like you were running to something? I didn't feel, you know, it's funny because in those moments of play and pushing the envelope, it just felt like we're going to tear it up tonight, you know, and it was more of a celebration. Like I never was an angry drunk. I never, never saw myself as leaning heavily on a crutch. I mean, for a whole year in junior college, I would wake up and smoke pot every day. I'd have to wake up my roommate to light the four foot bong for me because I couldn't reach it with my hand. And that's how I'd start the day. And I had all my classes on Tuesday, Thursday schedule. So five days off a week. And even in that whole year, I never thought like I'm overdoing it. It was just the thing to do. And now obviously that's, that's, that's all much different, but and we'll get into plant medicines, but I think that was really where it lifted the veil and showed me how much I was destroying myself without realizing it. 
when you decide, I want to go to ASU to play football, was that a means to an end? Where did you think that was? Was there some thought you had in the back of your mind? I might make it to the NFL. Yeah, I always wanted to play in the NFL. That was the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think there was a lot of things driving me for that. One, my love of the game. Like it was, it was my greatest joy. It was my first legal outlet to let off the steam. And because of the positions I played, I really got to, you know, I was button heads every single play of every moment I was on the field. Once I got to ASU, I didn't play much. I really was a bench warmer. And at ASU, I had to embrace my role as a secondary guy for the first time in my life. Everyone who makes it to college was an all-star in high school, you know, and, and the jump is even higher to the NFL. And I remember seeing a guy who graduated a year before me who had played, he started every game all four years on defensive line, which if you're a wide receiver, that's fine. But defensive line, that's pretty tough to do that, to, to start every game your entire, and he didn't make it to the NFL. And that was like, oh shit. All right. Maybe I should think about something else. Cause even if I get playing time my senior year, it's pretty unlikely that that's going to happen. And there was a lot of guys going into arena league and Canada football and things like that. And it was like, mm, I don't know. There was a piece of me that, that wanted to be the best or at least play with the best. And if I wasn't going to do that, there was no point. And I, I think that there was a decision because I could have gotten a scholarship to play at like a D2 school or D1 AA. And I said, no, I'd rather walk on and play with the big boys. So kind of having that mindset going in, I knew I wasn't going to play some subpar level of football, even though I probably could have extended my career there. It's amazing. I think for a lot of people that maybe aren't as familiar with that, what those jumps look like between high school division one and the NFL. I think I was having this discussion with my daughter a while ago. It must've been during the college football season. And I don't remember how it came up, but the point I wanted to make to her was if you take the very, very, very best team in college football, the team that's going to win the national championship, and you put them against the very, very worst team in the NFL, it would be the biggest blowout in the history of football. I mean, it in as many possessions as you could have, that's how many times the NFL team would score. And she just like couldn't understand like how that could happen. And I didn't have a great explanation for her. I said, I, I think one, it's just a much tighter selection process. And at the end of the day, once you reach the NFL, you're a professional and nothing else matters. Like this is your job, but it is interesting. And it must be sobering too, to get there and sort of realize, oh my God, like even if you're exceptional in college, it doesn't guarantee you get to this next level. Yeah. It doesn't guarantee that you're practice squad. And that's where I was like, damn. And I, I had a, a lot of guys from our team did go pro. Some of them played for a few years on practice squad. Other guys actually had like decent careers playing, starting in the NFL. And a couple started for the Dolphins, different teams. And it was cool to watch that. But it was like, it didn't seem like there was rhyme or reason to me. Because a lot of these guys in college, you know, they were good and they made progressions, but they just kept getting better. That was the difference. Like they were late bloomers, whatever you want to call it. But they kept improving, kept getting faster, kept learning the routes better or whatever the position was. And I think a big part of it is they also are the guys that don't get injured as much. I think injury avoidance is such an underappreciated piece of professional sports. I don't know the exact numbers, but you know, the median duration of an NFL player is staggeringly short. It's like three to five years. And so we can sort of celebrate these people that spend 10, 15 years in the NFL, but they're such outliers you know, the name of the game first and foremost, once you're there is just figure out a way to not get hurt. And you talk to Joe Ken or anybody that's a strength coach, that's all they're focused on. And it's, it's really, even in the off season, they might have time, periods of time where they're working on guys getting a little faster or guys getting a little stronger, a little more weight, that kind of thing. But come season, it's just preservation. That's it. Had you done any performance enhancing drugs in high school? No. I mean, I played actually my senior year, started with testosterone. I had a guy with Sustanon 250. And I realized I wanted to play college football. So that was the, that was the place like, all right, I got to put on some size. I've weighed about 220. Prior to or after? Prior to. And then 230. And you're what, 6'4"? Six, six, yeah, 6'3 six, and a half. So like that was the time where I think for me, it was about if I'm going to do this, let's do this. And being thin, you know, it was like, all right, I got to put on some size unless I'm going to change positions entirely. But I enjoyed the positions I played. So let's, let's pack on the pounds. And I was pretty disappointed only gaining 10 pounds, but there was, that was a catalyst to what sleep does, you know? And I had my dad telling me like, you got to sleep better. You got to get to bed on time. You can't stay out all night, those kind of things. And, and you got to eat well, you got to eat more. And at that point it was just a, a numbers game. You know, it didn't mean eating the food that I eat now. It was just mean eating more, you know, getting more protein in more calories in general. 
So I think once I started to pay attention to that stuff, that's where I was starting to gain the size. And then throughout junior college, was testosterone still kind of the, the staple of supplementation? Yeah, no doubt. And I gained fairly consistently, still kind of undersized. So I think by the end of my junior college, I was about 250, you know, and, and to put that in perspective, I mean, that's big for a lot of people, but there's linebackers that are 250 pounds, plenty of middle linebackers that are that size. So for the position, still small. Yeah. And then what's it like when you get to a place like ASU? Not, and again, I'm not singling out ASU. I think this is probably true. It has to be true of every division one school, right? Yeah. And I don't want to come across as Floyd Landis, so I'm not going to paint a picture of what other people are doing. No, know? no. Yeah. <laughs> just, just for, just for yourself. Treat. Like what, for, what was that for step me, up? It was good because I, you know, I was introduced to a doctor, a naturopath and he, for better and for worse. And we'll talk about the, what that worse looks like. He would give me anything that I wanted. Thankfully we were doing routine blood work to look at something. My father, who I included on this, we were pretty adamant about. So that's when I first experimented with growth hormone, IGF one, different things. I think when I, when I realized I wasn't going to go pro, that was the, when I started taking a decadurable and with testosterone and that was great for inflammation and just feeling better at that point. It really was like, how big can I get? And I still had a ceiling, you know, my senior year, I was 268. I couldn't gain a pound more. And I was having just, and just give me a sense of dose. How much you were, you were mixing decadron and sipionate 50, 50. Or like what, one to one ratio of those? No, it was probably six hundred milligrams of test and eight and four hundred milligrams of decadurbolin a week. And you would take a week. It's about a gram it. total. Yeah. Which is just amazing. I want to kind of put this in perspective for listeners. I have a subset of patients who are getting testosterone replacement therapy for, you know, hypogonadism, right? So middle aged guy who's you know, you can't get his testosterone back into a normal range with all the usual stuff, beginning by the way, with sleep is sort of rule number one. You don't run a place testosterone until a person's sleeping reasonably well. But to put this in perspective, I would say a normal starting dose of testosterone cypionate is a, somewhere in the ver, you know, vicinity of 80 to hundred milligrams a week. And we like to divide that twice a week because the half-life of cypionate is about three days. So you'll get a smoother dose a couple of patients will even do it daily. You know, they'll put in sort with of- With Cipionate. With Cipionate, wow. yeah. Sub-Q injection, and they'll do 10 to 13, 10 to 14 milligrams a day would be sort of a daily dose. And then that's, you know, per, and you know, it's really interesting, by the way, with that. You see no FSH, LH suppression. The natural range is about 11 milligrams a day, yeah. give or take for men. Yeah. So that's like where you're, you're kind of mimicking that. Yeah. That's the part that blows my mind is we just discovered this by accident when a patient just on his own decided to start date. Like he felt started out doing it, injecting once a week and then twice a week. And you're cutting the dose down, of course, each time. And then he decided, well, daily must give you the most perfectly smooth way to do it. And I said, well, yeah, if you don't mind giving yourself a little shot every day, but it's actually a pretty, the sub Q with the tiny needle is not a big deal. So when we looked at his blood, it was really amazing. He was like, he's the only patient I'd ever seen on testosterone cypionate who had normal FSH and LH. He looked like he was not taking exogenous testosterone. And then we tried this with a couple other patients and sure enough, that's the case. I think the highest amount of testosterone I've ever prescribed to a patient is probably in the neighborhood of 140 to 160 milligrams in a week. And if you're talking, did you say 600 of cypionate, 400 a deca or vice versa? Yeah, but they're one yeah, to one gram. equivalent. So it's a thousand a week, right? Which is, I've seen that a lot in athletes and bodybuilders and stuff like that. What kind of side effects do you have from a dose that high? Well, that's where I capped it, you know, and there's bodybuilders that'll go in the three to five gram a week range. And from what I know, loosely, they likely have more receptor sites and they're going to deal with the side effects no matter what's coming up for them. I'd get acne in season, but I think it was from the shoulder pads. I never washed those kind of things. So yeah, I'd get acne and stuff like that on the back. I don't know how much that affected my mind because it felt good. And with the amount of training that I was doing, it was a positive. Did you understand what testosterone at the time? I know today you have a much better understanding, of course, but at the time, did you understand what this molecule is doing to transcription factors in your you know, cells and how it's helping you recover better? Like, Or was it, were you not... I mean, that's maybe a dumb question. What what kid in college is thinking of that? But did you just think like taking this makes me bigger and stronger? Did you have a sense of why? Well, I understood an increased protein synthesis, things like that. I, I think there was a book called Anabolics 2000 by Dr. William Llewellyn, which is where I started to take a deep dive. And you know, that's the funny. That's so Llewellyn's Principles of Pharmacology is one of my favorite books on the entire study of anabolics. 
Yeah. I have like, it's like, you know, the volume. It's, yeah. It's, it's like a Bible. It's a Bible. And yeah. it's, it's long and wide. It's not just thick. Like it's, it's a really, it's a great place. If anybody's looking to do this, to have no, a better I, can't, I can't recommend it highly enough because one of the things I love about Llewellyn is totally unemotional. There's no editorializing, right? It's not like these things are horrible. These things are wonderful. It's like, okay, let's go through every single one of these molecules painfully deep and we'll just talk about the relative differences, similarities between them, what they do, what they don't do. And, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big, I'd love to meet Llewellyn. I don't know if he, he must be still alive. He starts to be young. He's gotta be. He was doing, I think, I think the last one I read was, I think he had 2007 was the last one that I, I read. Ha- I have I a know, more, I have I a more recent like, one than that. And he, and I've seen pictures of him and he looks like he's young. Buddy of mine had like 2011. So like, he's for sure still around if he's writing books. He's not on his deathbed. You know how hard it is to write a book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're reading Llewellyn, which is actually kind of interesting. I'm guessing not everybody who's taken testosterone is reading Llewellyn's principles of pharmacology to understand what's going on. One thing I, I just curious about, you mentioned you were never the nasty drunk, right? You were So one of the things that people talk about is, well, if you take that much anabolic steroid, you, it must change your mood. Did you experience that? I didn't feel, and that's what I was alluding to with that positive well-being. I couldn't wrap my head around roid rage for the life of me. I th- and then to that note, I began to see like whether the guy was on, like if I had friends that had that particular outcome from anabolics, they were that way without it. Yeah. They had, hadn't unpacked their shit to begin with. And that's why whatever amplifiers in them is going to draw that out. Same thing goes with alcohol or anything else. You know, you you give somebody a little fuel to the fire. And I think it was Wayne Dyer who said, if you squeeze an orange, what do you get? Orange juice. If somebody squeezes you, what do you get? Well, it's whatever's going to come out of you. Right. And that's, that's the difference. Not that I was all rainbows and fucking clouds in the inside. I still had a lot of work to do, which wouldn't come for years later. That's yeah. interesting to see at that dose. Cause I, I mean, I don't have experience clinically with those doses. I've, I've, seen it anecdotally like in cases like yours but i've i've never had the ability to clinically observe what happens at what we call super physiologic doses but at physiologic doses which i have lots of experience with patients i've never once seen any of these horror show side effects that people talk about and i've come to the same conclusion which is steroids are a lot like money you know people talk about well that guy's a rich asshole and it's like i don't think those are necessarily the same thing He's an asshole who then got a lot of money, and that just allowed him to amplify his as ad- assholeness, right? <laughs> his assholeness. <laughs> and similarly, like I think, if you take a really aggressive, angry person and you give them more anabolic steroids, you can probably amplify that phenotype. But don't, you don't create that phenotype. That's why I've seen some of the most beautiful people in the world. I've seen are some of the wealthiest people as well because they would just happen to be good people. You give them a bunch of money. Now they can amplify their good through that. So yeah, I think, I think of those the same. And it, but, but what's interesting is that at such high doses, my observation, at least anecdotally in you is still the same, which is didn't, didn't it actually seem to be quite positive? I, this is a topic I'm super interested in because I think that the science on this whole topic is so misunderstood. I think that the fear mongering around these drugs, and by the way, to be really clear, I have no idea if the doses you were taking are safe. My, my intuition is it's probably not a good idea to be clear. So anybody listening to this who thinks that me having this discussion is somehow endorsing taking a thousand milligrams a week of testosterone and testosterone equivalent is a good idea. I don't think it is, but that's mainly because I don't have data. I don't have long-term data. I've seen short-term data, right? I've seen studies of eight, 12, 16 weeks where you put athletes on those kinds of doses, which is effectively 10 times the normal amount of testosterone, these studies don't find bad outcomes. Of course, you were probably taking it for longer than 16 weeks. And that's my whole point, which is I don't know how to extrapolate outside of the normal window. But when you start to talk about normal physiologic doses and all the fear mongering that comes with that stuff, I don't know what it is about our society. We really love to misunderstand things. Um, There's a very famous story that was talked about in that documentary that Mark Bell made, or sorry, that Chris Bell made, mm-hmm. you know, the story about that Bigger, kid. stronger, faster. Yeah. I forget the boy's name. He got Taylor. really depressed when he jumped off because he didn't have post-cycle therapy. Yeah. I would, I would even put a different spin on that, which is, and again, this is, I don't mean to sound unempathetic at all because I know that in the documentary, they feature very prominently his father who's adamant that steroids killed his son. And if I were in his shoes, I'd, I think I'd probably say the same thing. 
But this gets to the point of, I would argue that people who are going to take steroids for non-medical use are probably searching for something anyway. There's a void that's probably trying to be filled there. And in the case of this boy who, I forget his name, begins with a T. I think it was like Tyler or Taylor or something like that. You know, high school kid. I think he was a baseball player, if I recall. You take 10 kids who play high school baseball. There's a subset of them that are going to gravitate towards wanting this. Maybe it's because they want to be better. Maybe they want to be better because they're sort of filling some other void. It's probably that that at least increases their susceptibility to depression and not that not that the testosterone is causing the depression. That, that's sort of my view on that. And I think that's a bit too nuanced to explain, but it feeds into this discussion of which one's driving the other. Yeah. And that's why when you look at studies of this stuff where you get the luxury of not having to rely on a person self-selecting into it and instead you can use the process of randomization. I just think these findings just, they never show up in the medical literature of testosterone use. So now you mentioned growth hormone as well. Why growth hormone? What did it offer above testosterone? I think from a recovery standpoint, and I don't know how much of that was placebo effect. And I was taking probably four IUs a day. Which is not that much actually in the big picture, is it? No, but I could feel the side effects, you know, like little tingly fingers in the middle of the night, some level of carpal tunnel. And that's also for sure had to do with the water weight I was carrying and, you know, just being a swole for, for lack of a better word. Did you ever take growth hormone without testosterone? No. So we don't know what growth hormone alone would have felt like. Yeah. But I do remember, I mean, playing defensive line, you get bumps and bruises every day and I rolled my ankle really hard. And the next day it was like nothing had ever happened. And I, I, I was astonished. I thought I was going to wake up and have blue and purple around my foot for a month. It was a bad, bad sprain. And literally the next day, like there was no swelling. It felt great. I went right back to practice and I could do everything again. So I was like, okay, this is worth $1,000 a month. Like it, it just made perfect sense to me at that point. How did you come up with the money for all this? Was the growth hormone alone $1,000 a month? It certainly was. So without, wow. uh, <laughs> let's just say that part was sponsored. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <I don't wanna> <laughs> say, <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. And the testosterone, while nowhere near as expensive at the doses you're taking, can't be, it's still got to be a couple hundred bucks a month, right? Yeah. Especially because it's through a doctor and obviously insurance isn't covering any of that. Now, did you guys get drug tested in college? We did. And I don't know if you remember this, but there was a thing, What I think it was, uh, I don't want to get the guy's name wrong. Maybe we can look it up. Ryan, can you look up if it was Ontario Smith that got caught with the Wizenator? So the, the Wizenator oh, 5000. I forgot about the Wizenator. The Wizenator, the old Wizenator. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. I remember going into the weed shop back then. Um, of course, they didn't have cannabis there. They just had bongs and, and whatever. And I saw this thing and they had like seven different colors of a penis. I was like, what the hell is this doing here? And they're like, oh man, that's for your piss test. And I was like, are you serious? Okay, all right. We got confirmation it was Ontario Smith. He fucked it up for everyone. But, uh, you know, I, I see all the different colors and I'm like, huh, so how does it work? You, you get somebody's clean urine? He's like, no, you don't even have to do that. It comes with synthetic urine. And then there's a Japanese heat pad that sticks to the outside. And then you have the other, the, the other part of it pressed against your pubic hair or whatever. And then when you're asked to pull it out, you just pull out that one. And it's kind of like, do you remember the toy water weenie back in the 80s? It's got a little click in. It's like surgical tubing you'd fill with water and then squirt people. So anyways, you, you unclick this thing and uh, just free flows and you can push on it a little bit to get it out, but it's always at like one and a half X, whatever the hundred milliliter standard is. Does the drug test or not actually look at you voiding? I mean, I had a guy look at my penis when he saw the Wizenator, but I had my pants on. He didn't make me drop trial, you know, whereas okay, so what does he do when he sees a purple penis? Well, <laughs> I have a funny story about that. So my penis, the, the, my fake penis didn't, didn't look far <laughs> this off. This discussion is if taken out of context is out of control. Okay. We, we'll have him clip this for social. My fake penis looked very similar to my actual penis in terms of color. Loaning that out to one of my teammates oh, for who was sake. half black didn't go so well for him. Thankfully, he said, as long as the test is clean when he got caught, I won't get you in trouble. And of course, he got off because he had clean piss. The issue what we saw with the Wizenator in pro sports is that the synthetic urine contained no levels of hormone. So you'd show zero on testosterone. You'd have zero, zero testosterone, which they zero knew Zero sex was. hormones across the board. So then they'd know something was up. That would qualify as a positive test. I was kind of rolling the dice with NCAA. I figured at that point I wasn't going to get, you know, what are they going to do? Bust the guy who's fucking third string. Barely made travel squad. So... 
I was rolling the dice there. They make you go to your ankles with your pants or whatever you're wearing. The team guys, they just glance down, see what you got. As long as it's a penis and you're not pulling something out of a cup, you're okay. In other words, there was sort of the, was this the NCAA that was basically turning a blind eye to this then? The team guys. And then the, the NCAA, they would have you pull your pants down, but they're, you know, I don't, from what I understand, not super weird about it because it wasn't invasive. Like I hear horror stories from, from the guys that are fighting now and have USADA knocking on their door at 3 a.m. Yeah. The Wizenator is not going to work when USADA or WADA comes, right? No, not even close. Never would have. I'm amazed. I mean, I never really thought about this problem specifically, but I'm amazed people haven't come up with artificial bladders and things that are more nuanced. Well, I think it was, uh, what was that movie with the old football movie? I think it was in the nineties with Latimer. Oh, Remember Latimer? yes, yes, he yes. Jack to the gills. Yeah. He yeah, did yeah, the, yeah. the oil change where he would yes. pull urine out of his bladder and then have someone else's injected in with a yes, 10cc yes, yes. syringe. Oh, how can I be blanking on what that was? That wasn't any given Sunday, was it? No. Uh, the program. Yeah. Yeah. James Conn. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how often that was going down. I don't think people were going to that, those kind of extremes in college, maybe at higher levels of sport, but... Is growth hormone detectable on any of their tests? It certainly wasn't even something they were testing for in college. I know a couple of people who have had that come up for them in fighting now with USADA. To what degree that's accurate, I'm not sure. So, you know, a lot of these guys have lawyered up and, and are fighting it. Whether or not they are successful or not, I have no idea. So college comes to an end, you sort of realize you're not going to make it to the NFL. What are you thinking about as the next chapter? I was just you in the moment. You can model the Wizenator. That's always <laughs> got to be on the table as an yeah. option, a <laughs> work opportunity. That's, yeah, that's all right. That was my next venture. <laughs> um, you know, I quit going after my senior year of football and I was really starting to battle my own personal demons at that point. That same doctor. So I talked about the better and worse of having a doctor that would give me anything. He was prescribing me Two milligrams Xanax, we called them Xanny bars because they had the four squares, 60 at a time. 10 milligram Valium, 60 at a time with five refills on both. 10 milligram Norco's. I didn't know that was even legal. Meaning I didn't know. It's that not legal. Pharmac- he went to jail later. Oh, okay. <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> <say>. so, <laughs> he gone. One of my friends died. So that, that, that guy, uh, I, I'm sure he's out now. But needless to say, also 10 milligrams of Vicodin, 60 at a time, five refills. Now, thankfully for me personally, and I've lost a lot of friends to opiates, it was very hard for me to take a high dose and feel good. I would get nauseated and puke violently. So there was always like this. You had a built-in governor. Yeah, built-in governor when it came to opiates. But having had a lot of stuff that I hadn't worked on internally, and we can dive into that, but it just, these anti-anxiety medications were fucking perfect. Like I would feel great. There's a euphoria. I'd sleep very well if I was using cocaine or ecstasy. And these are pressed shitty pills, not the type of MDMA we talk about with Rick Doblin, just a whole different ball game. I'd be up till 5 a.m. Then I take my Xanax, something like that, you know, and that's, you know, you're playing that roller coaster. So uh, you're already done with football, but you're still like finishing college at this point. Mm-hmm. And that's when I quit going to school. So I didn't see, I, I'd, I'd finished 95% of my communications classes and sociology. And at that point, in order to stay eligible, I'd switched my degree so many times. There was this bullshit degree called a Bachelor in Interdisciplinary Studies, which is fine. It's like two minors to equal a major. And I enjoyed the coursework. But once I got to my senior year, a lot of the classes became actual BIS classes where you would go in and have to write these long ass papers that you'd present to a potential employer on why it was actually better that you had a basket weaving degree and not an actual degree. And I couldn't stand it. Like it was just so fake to me and really like not enjoying school at that point, not having a reason to be there, not having a reason to stay. And are you taking loans out to be in school at this point? Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. So you're paying to do this thing that you think is not helpful. Correct. You know, I said, I'd take a semester off. My parents didn't really fuss over it and really got into pills with alcohol and cocaine and ecstasy. And that was something that I've been doing, but because of football keeping me, there was a point in time where I knew I had to straighten up each and every year and really being a fan of the gym and who I was training with, that also would kind of regulate me. So even in the off season, I was still kind of, I was mindful of the debauchery. And then without that, it was mindless debauchery really. And I was very depressed. I didn't know what I wanted to do from that point on and probably came to one of the most depressing points in my life. And to give some background from, and I talked about this on a solo podcast I did a long time ago, which for sure, I don't think anyone here has heard it, 
But from about seven years old on, I had thoughts of suicide and like pretty vivid, like thinking of my dad's handguns or his rifles or how I would use a bow and arrow, put it plainly. I remember having a conversation with my dad on the deck of our condo and I asked him, what would happen if I fell off of this and landed face first in the concrete? And he said, you probably wouldn't die. You'd just be really messed up from that point on. And, but that was me. He didn't realize at the time that was me checking to see, like, can I kill myself by jumping off this fucking balcony? And how old were you? Seven? For that seven. Day? Yeah. Six, seven. And that would circle back at, I mean, many times throughout the year that would circle back. What do you think was at the root of that? Uh, it was really hard. It was really hard to see my family fight so often. You know, it was constant. And my little sister is just a year younger than me. And I could could feel her shift. I could feel her close inside and wall off. And, uh, you know, being the oldest, my dad was the oldest. He was a little bit harder on me than her. And that stuck out. Um, It was just really, I mean without too many details, it was very, very difficult. And it really felt, I think at the root of a lot of depression is this concept that it will never get better. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no way out of this. And that's, that's how I felt most, most of my childhood was just like, this is not going to get better. I remember when I was 10, my mom said, I'm thinking about divorcing your father. And I said, yes, do it. And my sister was in panic. She didn't want her family to get broken apart. But a part of me knew once that happened, like they would be better people for it because they weren't meant to be together. And it took three more years for that to actually happen. But yeah, it was, it was, it was incredibly difficult. And I think uh, coming to this place now where once again, I felt like I didn't have any viable option of doing something that was meaningful with my life. And not to mention from a neurochemistry standpoint, just playing with all the buttons you know, up, down, up, down, lack of sleep. You had Matthew Walker on for three episodes. Like I now see that very clearly when I read his book, Why We Sleep, I was like, well, yeah, no shit. No shit. I was, I was messed up in the head. I, I, so I watched the sun come up many, many nights. And the beautiful double-edged sword of an anti-anxiety pill is that you feel fucking great while you're on it. And the second you stop taking it, all that unworked through stuff is still there. It's just waiting to come up once that chemical's out of your body. And so I had a fight with my girlfriend at the time and there really was this thought in my head that I'll never be loved. I will never find love. And with that, I took every remaining pill that I had and I drove up to uh, the top of parking lot seven at Arizona state. Thankfully a security guard guard saw me pulling up at like 2 AM, got out of the car, stripped down naked and walked climbed uh, one more flight of stairs and and was standing on the edge about ready to jump. And I heard, Hey, what are you doing up there? And I looked back, actually, let me rewind that. I had been to church growing up, but I didn't consider myself a religious person. Most of that stuff didn't resonate with me at all, particularly with regarding gay people going to hell. Like I was from the Bay area, that shit really didn't resonate with me. And there was a lot of other things that stood up to me as Hypocritical. Didn't, it didn't make sense. Yeah. Hypocritical, that kind of stuff. And, but as I was standing there before the security guard said anything, that was my first real spiritual experience like this. I don't know if it was the chemicals kicking in, but this wash of warmth came throughout my body from head to toe. And it was the most peace that I had felt ever in my entire life. You think it's because you sensed it might be over? Yeah, it was the time to go. For me, like there was no, no reason to stay. And uh, this voice, and it might have been a voice in my head. It might have been outside of me. I don't think that's the point. The voice just said, not yet. It's okay. I, I... So this guy gets you off the ledge, literally. Gets me off the ledge, and I wake up in a hospital with all my family there. They flew out from California, obviously, to, to Arizona. I don't really have a recollection of what happened after that, other than I remember asking my mom, like, why are, why is this male nurse such a dick? And she was like, you, you weren't very nice to him. You weren't very nice to anyone here. And, uh, 
knowing myself, I just kind of laughed and said, yeah, that's, that's for sure what happened. <laughs> so <laughs> I spent about a week in a detox center. They had everything from group therapy to uh, activities. They wanted to wean me off the anxiety medication, knowing how long I'd been on that. And um, didn't, like I had mentioned, there was no real problem with the opiates, so they didn't wean that. But they put me on Klonopin for the week. And the first dose I took, uh, I, I remember walking up to the nurse like, I'm, I'm fucking high right now. I don't want to be high. I want that. I want to, I want to go cold turkey. And they're like, no, it's, it's really important that we wean you because you can have potential side effects here. And I was like, I don't care. I'm not going to take it. I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to take it. So thankfully they, they cut my dose to nothing. That was an interesting time because there was a lot of people there that had, I mean, not to make comparisons, but people that didn't have all the same opportunities that I had. And didn't look the way that I looked and weren't as young as me or as fit as me or any of the things that I had going on. A lot of them didn't have family there supporting them. My family would come in every day. They, they were staying in a hotel. They had nothing else to do but but check on or after me. I think at that stage, you know, when you have other people saying like, what are you doing here? You have so much going on. It's like, you don't fucking know. And that's to my point, when someone's depressed, they see through their lens they don't see through anyone else's lens. It's just like, this is water, right? And so you could have everyone on earth, fucking Obama could show up and say like, look what you have going on for you. And you'd say, you don't know what's going on for me. And that's really how I felt. When I got out, I had a psychologist and a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist, I was pretty adamant that I didn't want to go down the SSRI rabbit hole. I had family members that had done that. And I saw it was just a a merry-go-round of different things. And Finally, when they found something that would work, they'd inevitably have to increase the dosage. So I said no to that. I was prescribed lithium and I took it for about a week. And I remember thinking like, I am a fucking mute. My whole life, I've been an extrovert. I've enjoyed talking to people. I've walked through public speaking classes in college. Now I'm a mute. There was no high. There was no low. The diagnosis was bipolar. What dose of lithium did they put? They must have put you on a very heavy dose. Probably. I know some, you know, I think we know some people that benefit very greatly from a low dose of that. But at the time it was like, I can't do this either. And I remember talking to the psychiatrist who actually resonated more with me than the psychologist. I've had great therapists, but that guy wasn't it. Psychiatrist was like, all right, if you don't want to take anything, read these. And he handed me six studies on fish oil and the brain. And that was my first like, Oh, okay. From like a holistic standpoint of what supplementation can look like rather than just creatine and testosterone, maybe there's something to this. And I uh, started something with fish oil. More importantly than that, started creating space for myself to actually look at my life and just create like a distance from the party atmosphere. Like maybe I can take a break. And with that, started to see a shift, started to get goals. Were you back in class at this point? No, I never went back to school. Never went back to school. So I'm still a senior at ASU officially. You know, I had fought a lot growing up, like I talked about, and I had watched the UFC from its infancy, was a huge fan of pride. I had no intention of becoming a professional fighter, but I knew what I was missing. And what I was missing in football was camaraderie. It was being able to butt heads. It was some physical interaction with another human. And then the training. I would go instead of training with all these guys and having some of the best coaches in the world hyping me up before I lift, I'm lifting by myself at 24 hour fitness. I'm on a fucking treadmill. Like there was no real draw to do that. I felt like a rat on the wheel. Knowing that's something I missed, I wanted to start training in mixed martial arts just for the training, just for the camaraderie, just for the ability to learn something new each each day and not really know like, I don't want to have to design my entire workout in the gym. Like, let me go here and learn something brand new and uh, maybe make some friends in the process. And probably three months into that, there was a guy, a gym owner out in Arizona who ran Rage in the Cage. It was a local, very low level show. And he said, dude, you're big, you're handsome. You played football, you're athletic. Fight for me at heavyweight. You only have to do it one time. If you don't want to do it again, you don't have to. And so I said, all right. In my first two fights, I won in under 30 seconds. I'm not saying I was great or anything like that. What I am saying is there is a difference between an athlete that comes from division one and a lot of the guys fighting heavyweight at the time. And this was in MMA? Yes. Mixed martial arts. And so it, what are the rules? Just quickly, what are the rules? What are the parameters? I think everybody's heard of MMA. People sometimes don't understand the difference between MMA and UFC. Like they're sometimes people use these terms synonymously, but let's start with what mixed martial arts means. 
an analogy I like to use is, is mixed martial arts is to the UFC as tissues are to Kleenex. You know, a lot of people won't say, can you hand me a tissue? They'll say, pass me a Kleenex, whether it's Kleenex brand or not. So the UFC being the highest level of sport that is mixed martial arts. And then, you know, mixed martial arts can have, there's, there's, there's MMA shows all over the world now at at varying levels, but um, mixed martial arts is the practice of bringing all things together. Typically they use four to five ounce gloves that are fingerless. So you can grab, you can't strike in the back of the head. There used to be varying rules, you know, in pride, you could stomp a guy's face. You could soccer kick a guy's face while he's on the ground. You could knee a guy's head while he's on all fours. None of that's allowed in the UFC or in, in all of North America, to my understanding. Can't what else gouge. can you not do? Yeah, it's can't probably easier gouge. to say can't, what you can't yeah, do. Yeah, you can't kick to the nuts, can't pull hair. And a lot of this stuff when, when MMA started was allowed. You know, it was no holds barred. What's the wh- Where's the genesis of MMA? When did it really first start? I think it's different, you know, for different people. Different camps would say it was Bruce Lee. Different camps would say... So um, they would say Jeet Kune Do was the original MMA. Yeah, and Kaji Kempo also was um, different forms of full contact karate, kickboxing, jiu-jitsu... We just had John Hackleman on my podcast, and he was a Kaji Kempo background out of Hawaii, and now he created Hawaiian Kempo. So there, there's there's merit in both, you know. But it is that bridging of different forms and the arc of MMA. If you haven't seen it, started off as like this is what I'm good at versus this is what you're good at. It was like the kumite in blood sport. So you'd have a boxer against a sumo wrestler, and then you know as it progressed, people began to have more than one trick pony, a couple skill sets. So. I'm good at uh, defending takedowns and I'm really good at stand up. So I can stand at bang, sprawl and brawl were terms that were being used. Or I'm a great wrestler and I can pound you when you're on the ground. So ground and pound became a thing. And then as it's transitioned into now, you have to know everything in any position because if you have a weakness, it's going to be exploited. And in parallel to this, you've got this Brazilian jiu jitsu that is being, you know, you've got these incredible Gracies and all these other guys over there doing this other form of traditional jiu-jitsu and when does that start to merge with mma because today it's almost impossible to distinguish like it's almost impossible to imagine mma without brazilian jiu-jitsu right i think right as the ufc came along that was the point oh you know, that they, was the point and when did the, the ufc great, come into 93 music? so it was a different group of ownership i forget the guy's name bob something but um he started the ufc with in large part with the gracies and they according to their story, wanted to bring in a guy who wasn't the best, wasn't the most fit, wasn't the strongest. And they, they brought in Hoist Gracie just to illustrate, like, this is a technical thing. It's not that he's a gifted athlete and he's going to do this to you. He's not our best athlete. He's not our best Gracie. And he can still do this to you. I mean, they showed what jujitsu was all about. It was awesome to watch that, to see the difference. But now you see even the sport of jujitsu has really progressed. There's guys that focus on that their whole lives and careers, and, and you see them in jiu-jitsu sport competitions, and it's just a whole different level. They're orders of magnitude greater than some of the guys in the UFC. Going back to when you start training in an MMA gym and have these couple of quick fights, at that point in time, outside of your fitness and athleticism, strength, et cetera, did you have any formal training in boxing, kickboxing, martial arts? It was only wrestling. You, you wrestled I mean, in high I school, had, right? I had... Let me correct myself. When I was 17, I went with another wrestling teammate of mine. We didn't want to do track or, or any of that spring sport. So we, we went into AKA American Kickboxing Academy, which is in San Jose. At that time, Frank Shamrock was the coach there. This is today regarded as one of the most prolific training institutes of MMA. In the world. Yeah. Still to this day. But you just got lucky. It just happened very, to be in your backyard. Yep, very fortunate that it literally was in my backyard. And, and we, you know, the first three months I went there, that was that was about it. I went there for three months and started training for football again. It was awesome. I loved it. And I was just thinking like, I'm going to learn this stuff so I can kick more ass on the street. You know, that was really it. And it'll keep me in shape and maybe help me be a better wrestler, those kind of things. But it took some time. I mean, once I got back into fighting well, once I started fighting professionally and, and really trying to learn this stuff, in large part, I had forgotten a lot from wrestling and, and most of the things that I learned at AKA when I was young. So, but also having learned how to be coachable was really just uh, there to absorb as much as I could. And out in Arizona, we had some good guys. It's not at the level that it is now. You know, you have some pretty great gyms out in Arizona these days, but it was still, still kind of young in terms of who you'd train with. I didn't know that I'd fight in the UFC or anything like that. It was just fun for me. And again, you could think for the listener, the UFC is like the NFL and 
you have an infinite number of other arena football leagues and all these other sorts of things. And you could be playing in those leagues and maybe one day think you make it to the UFC or the NFL as it were. Yeah. And that was the goal. I mean, or, or pride, they were equal, but I, it wasn't my dream to play or fight in Japan for that matter. I would have happily done it, but, um, I just kept going, you know, and I, I fought often. I wasn't training nearly by the standard I needed to be at. So as I was building this record. What kind of injuries record, were you sustaining at this? Zero. <laughs> I mean, I had no injuries at all early on in my career. It was only when I got to, when I circled back. So I, I was 6-0, and oh, was now fighting in King of the Cage, which you could look at as kind of a bridge between the two. Still a massive jump from King of the Cage to the UFC, but a lot of guys that fought in the UFC had fought in King of the Cage at some And how much point. are you getting paid per fight? $1,000 a fight. And how frequently do they let you fight? Mm, it was four times a year with the contract. Prior to that, it was $100 a fight in Rage in the Cage. It's just to give you perspective, $100 to go in and fight. Oh, God. That's even worse than boxing. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, that's still in the... I don't know what it is today. You know, this is still when things were starting... Or relatively, I mean, it's not like I was fighting in '93. That's when it was starting. Got to six and zero. Oh, had a loss, my first loss of my career in King of the Cage. What happened in that fight? I really hadn't hadn't trained much for it because I was walking through people. It was almost like Tyson and Buster Douglas, you know. And and my coach was trying to get me in there more, and it was like, yeah, whatever, you know. And it, you think of humbling experiences. Like I was just had my head in the clouds. Just thought I was the shit. Thought I was going to just walk through people until I got to the UFC. Then I'd really have to start training. So I went into a fight, I think it was in Laughlin, Nevada, and just got the shit beat out of me. I mean, it was the first time I got stung with a punch, kneed me in the head. The, the, it was Herb Dean who ref the fight. He actually stopped the fight with me on my feet. I was getting beat so bad. I had a really good coach who actually How had long a, did that fight take? It happened in the first round. It was a bad beating. My striking coach trained under Dan Inosanto, who was one of Bruce Lee's main students. So he was a JKD guy. And I learned JKD from one of Dan's six students. That's amazing. Yeah, this guy, Vince Perez Mazzola, incredible human. He he basically pulled me aside and he said, look, I can teach you all of this stuff. It, things that people aren't doing in the UFC, but you need more than me. You need a team. You need training partners. I think all my training partners were fought at 185, you know, a weight class underneath me or two weight classes underneath me. And he was like, you should go home and train at AKA again. They have a team. They're great. There's many great guys that fight in the UFC, and that's where you ultimately want to go now. So you should move home. And at the same time, my strength coach from ASU hit me up, Joe Ken, and he said, Kingsbury, I heard you're fighting right now. You got to go back to AK. What the fuck are you doing? And I was like, I don't know, coach. I kind of like it here in Arizona. He's like, no, fuck all that. Kane's there. So Kane was the the heavyweight wrestler at ASU. He took fifth, I think, in, in NCAA his senior year in nationals. And, um, He's one of the greatest heavyweights of all time, but he he was only two and zero at AKA at the time. So I moved back in with my dad and started training at AKA, largely just getting my ass beat every day, until I could finally get my skills and endurance and everything up to par to be able to hang, just to hang with Kane for one round. We we were rotating fresh bodies on him. I mean, it was a really hard entry point into what being a real pro looked like. And how did you guys spar? Like, uh, I'm obviously very familiar with boxing where you can spar. You, you're using slightly larger gloves. You've got headgear, though. I don't think headgear does much except prevent cuts. And it's just a little easier to dial back the intensity. But when it comes to elbows, knees, things like that, like how are you sparring basically at 100% all the time? So we weren't using elbows at the time. If you had knee pads, you could knee. Generally, we wouldn't knee to the head. It was full go. I mean, it was, it was a fight three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're in a fight period. Thankfully that we've seen the sport evolve and that's not really the case. There's still some smaller gyms and backwoods areas that still spar like that. It was a huge issue in the UFC for a long time. Fighters would get to camp. They'd train like animals. They'd spar as hard as the fight was. And then a week before the fight, they'd get hurt or the week of the fight, they would get hurt. It was a real issue. And I think it still happens now, but thankfully people are being more mindful of the approach and also knowing once you have that level of experience and you've, you've kind of weeded out who's not going to make it, you can scale back and work technically. Yeah. You look at things like Muay Thai, which is a, a form of kickboxing from Thailand. They fight on a weekly basis. So their sparring is just touch and go. It's highly technical and they're never trying to hurt one another. So I think we're, we're going to start to see that more and more in the sport of mixed martial arts. I did Muay Thai for two years when I was in college and, uh, 
some of the most painful injuries I had were, you know, blank shin to shin contact. I mean, <laughs> my God. That's the only thing that hurt me in, in actually inside the octagon in, in a fight in the UFC was shin to shin contact. I could get drilled and actually touch canvas, snap out of it and get back up. And I wouldn't have felt the punch like a hard rib shot. If I get the wind knocked out of me, that hurts. But the shin to shin, that's the one where you're like, wow, I might not be able to walk tonight. Well, I, I trained, I was trained by a guy from Thailand who, God, I still remember his name too. I'd love to, I'd love to know what he's up to now, but his name was Eric and his shins were so badly conditioned, meaning so well conditioned for the concept of the sport that you could hit them with not all out, but you could take a baseball bat and somewhat like just gently, not gently, but like with medium force, whack his shins. And he was unfazed at a level where even if you roll a baseball bat across a normal person's shin at the wrong angle, it's very sensitive. And <laughs> yeah, I was kind of like, look, I mean, I'm done with trying to be a professional fighter here. I, I go to college now. I don't, I don't think I'm going to do the work that's necessary to make my shins look like Eric's over there. <laughs> it's just not, I mean, it was just, it's struck. Even though I didn't know much at the time, I sort of knew like, that's just the bridge too far right now, <laughs> but gives you an appreciation for that sport. I mean, I used to love, I mean, I love Thai boxing, but we would spar mostly with really heavy equipment that would enable us to do this. And we would focus on sort of different types of things. Like there were some days when it was just all going to be low leg sweeps and you were going to be in shin guards and you were really heavily guarded. Cause I always felt the worst thing you could do is train at half speed because then it conditions you to be doing something at half speed. You want to be able to be explosive. So you just have to have more, more barrier there when you're doing it. But having never done mixed martial arts, it's just nothing but awe I have for how you have to be so prolific at so many things. You can be a great striker and I can sort of relate to that because at least I know what those things, I know what it would be like to be great at that. I was never great, but I, I understand those sports well enough. But then you think you could spend your whole life doing that. And if you're a horrible grappler, you get destroyed Yeah, and vice versa. That's where it's at now for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think when you look at guys like Daniel Cormier and John Jones, anybody who's great in the sport these days, they came in with something already in their back pocket, you know, a lifelong wrestling pedigree or a lifelong in traditional martial arts pedigree, and then they could just focus on these other things because you only have so much bandwidth. There's only so much time in the day to really learn and acquire new skills, to polish them, to feel comfortable enough to use that in a fight at full speed with all the pressure of people watching you and pay-per-view and that kind of stuff going on. It's a lot. And I started kind of late when you consider things. Thankfully, I wasn't missing the athletic background. But from the technical standpoint, I entered the UFC as a white belt in jiu-jitsu. I mean, there was, there was gaping holes in my game that remained there until I finished. While this whole new thing is going on, how are you processing or what's the state of your mind with respect to this near-death experience you've had and the culmination of really kind of what's been going on since you were a kid? Like, has this, has this now backburnered and sort of been supplanted by a new addiction, so to speak? Yeah, for sure. I think having something to look forward to and train for and, and, and really some level of meaning of what I want to do, I didn't obviously know I wasn't going to fight for the rest of my life. I'd already experienced that in football. But this kind of gave me a second go at it at, as a professional athlete in that as I was working towards being the best that I possibly could, those are the things really, they, they weren't coming up for me because I also had an outlet. If I was feeling weird inside and I go and fucking punch someone's lights out, like that's a good feeling, right? Like it's letting the let out. It was a great outlet. In tandem, there was a couple catalysts, big catalysts that changed my life forever. One, I started working with a sports psychologist who introduced me to breath work and some level of mindfulness. And the idea was, because I mean, early on in my fight career, there was there was no issues. I had ultimate confidence. I was going to walk through people. But now I'm at the UFC all these people are, are as good, you know, as me, if not better. And that negative monkey mind chatter that comes up, it was nonstop. So how do I control that? And the breath was really my first entry point into quieting my mind and, and finding some level of stillness, at least right before the fight. And this was holotropic? No, we would do various forms of slow breathing, trying to get down into parasympathetic. So at least two to one exhale to inhale, four seconds in, seven seconds hold, eight seconds out, things like that or 10, 10, 10, 10 in, 10 out, or 10 in, 10 hold, 10 out. And those were, I mean, fairly basic forms of breath work, but I could feel the difference. And practicing that right when I woke up and right before I went to bed helped me sleep at night because there was, I mean, 
<laughs> it's one thing to say I'll fight a guy on this certain date, but you sign a contract every day up until that date happens. It's very hard to sleep. Cannabis helped me with that too, specifically THC, not just CBD, but there was a lot that helped me there to actually fall asleep. Breathwork being a big component of that. The second piece that really was a game changer was uh, a boxing coach that I had who was Native American and Mexican. And he would take me to the reservation to do traditional sweat lodges. So we'd do the Tim as call before every fight camp started to kind of zero in on what we wanted and after every fight for healing and reflection. And it wasn't long before I just kind of looked at him and I said, coach, when are we going to use La Medicina? And he just started laughing and he said, I've been waiting for you to ask. And we started working with psilocybin. Had you ever done it before? I had done it before highly inappropriately, you know, at a house like party. Like recreationally. Yeah. At a house party on alcohol and cannabis with a bunch of people I didn't know. And just, <laughs> just, just ultimate, horror stories, ultimate horror stories, ultimate horror stories. But this is my first real introduction to use intention, to have respect and reverence for the plants being used. And in a completely safe and perfect environment, you know, there's no running water, no lights. Uh, you're just out in nature, you know, and it's just my coach there watching me and maybe a couple other fighters. And really, that's where I started to begin to uncover some things and really sort not too much from the childhood, but really getting direction and, and a true sense of peace inside that was lasting. And uh, at a certain point, I had a friend go down to Peru. He was going to hike Machu Picchu. And I was like, that's awesome, man. Tell me how it goes when you get back. So he actually calls me early and I'm like, aren't you in Peru? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I just got here. But here's the thing. I can either hike Machu Picchu or I can go do this thing called ayahuasca. It's going to take five days to do either. And I was like, hike Machu Picchu. Why are you even calling me? That's why you went there. And he's like, no, you got to look it up. So I went to arrowid.org. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the site. It's got every drug from caffeine to meth in there, including all plant medicines. They give the pharmacology of it. They give the chemistry of it. They give the legality of it. And there's trip reports. So I remember pulling up a trip report from, from ayahuasca. And the first thing it, it was titled, it said the apex of teacher plans. And I thought, hmm, maybe there is something to this. And so I asked my coach if he would come with me to Peru because I didn't speak Spanish well and I wanted him there. And he's guided me in every meaningful experience I've had thus far. And he said, I'll bring Peru to us. And we found people that would work with ayahuasca with us locally. And that was an absolute game changer. That's where, I, I mean, it, that shifted more things in me on how I perceive the world than anything else in terms of a catalyst for that. And again, you know, like, as we talked about before, it's not to glorify these substances. There's a right way and a wrong way to do anything. But under that guidance in that setting with that medicine, no doubt, some of the most powerful changes in the way I, I view consciousness, my, my spirituality, um, were you still fighting while you were ex experimenting with these? I was, I, was I was fighting when I was using psilocybin. When I got introduced to ayahuasca, and to be clear, I was using psilocybin from then on, still to this day. Not often, but yeah, still using psilocybin. When I was introduced to ayahuasca, I had just torn my labrum. So it was after a brutal fight in Nottingham, England, where I had my, orbital, my left orbital blown out for a second time. And my left eyebrow was fractured from a head kick in that fight. And it was my third loss in a row. I had always said, if I get to be a 500 fighter at any level, then I'll quit because it's, it's not fucking baseball, you know, and I am taking damage is clearly if somebody can punch me hard enough in the face to break bones, it's taking its toll on my brain. At that point, I had some time off. I mean, I tore my labrum. It's a, it took me, it was a year to fully recover from that. Mm. How are you supporting yourself at this point? Are you making enough in the Ooh. UFC? I was not making enough in the UFC even when I was fighting. So I lived in my mom's detached garage for probably the last four and a half years I was there and I worked at a, a pseudo strip club. It was a bikini bar out in Sunnyvale as a bouncer, manager, and bartender. And I'd go in twice a week. Thankfully, I'd go in on weekends and pull off two 11-hour shifts. Losing sleep, of course, not in the best environment, but I still have a lot of gratitude because that put food on the table the entire time I was fighting. At that point, sponsorships were starting to be pulled. People know, or maybe not, but uh, there was a Reebok deal that UFC did, and they no longer allowed us to have our own personal sponsors. So money was being taken out from under our feet, left and right. And it was really important that I had a side job while I was fighting. So the ayahuasca started when you were in this year of the torn labrum? Correct. So you're three, you've lost three. What's your record in total at this point? Hmm, in the UFC, I was four and four. So a winning record overall, but four and four, I think 11 and 11 and four at that point. 
Okay, got it. So you're at a real crossroads, which is, am I retiring from this or do I have one more hurrah left in me? Yeah. And I wasn't getting super clear on that from ayahuasca. I don't think it was my intention to make that decision until I had repaired my shoulder and was able to train again. But all of the important things in my life were coming up for me, the deep work. I mean, everything from childhood stuff to how I treated myself with drugs and alcohol, you know, seeing, seeing those patterns come up. I remember I was, I was in Colombia getting ready to do it. And they told us we were going to use a plant. They use a lot of different admixtures, but there was this plant of a thousand ants. They said, why do you call it that? And I said, well, we're going to rub it on you in the middle of the night. It feels like a thousand ants are biting you. And so I kind of chuckled and I said, well, what does it do? And they said, you're going to think of a negative emotion that you want to remove. Could be anger, could be sadness, could be whatever, just something that keeps coming up for you. And I said, anger. And we got in a long conversation about that, but they'd also talked before that ceremony about alcohol addiction and cannabis addiction. And immediately I thought, oh, this is for everyone else. Like I'm good. This is for everyone else. And, 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 you know, it, it does affect a lot of people, you know? And so I just thought of it that way. And then a great chunk of that night was me reliving puking violently over a railing in my chonies and telling my sister to get away from me. You know, I didn't want people around to see me like that. And I had countless nights like that. And even when I was fighting in the UFC, it was really a polarized way to live. In fight camp, I was a perfect little angel. I wouldn't watch TV. I would read every night, trying to study things that would help me in fighting, from mobility to diet, nutrition, you name it, eating super clean food. And then the second the fight is over, it's whoppers and alcohol and blow and whatever I can get my hands on. So that went back and forth for a while up until this ceremony. I was like, wow, okay, time to scale back outside of camp and really treat myself better. It's so interesting when you look at the statistics, I, I'm borrowing a lot of this. So the numbers might, I might be a little bit off cause it's been a while since I've, I've read it, but maybe you've heard me talk about it in the past. One of the most important books I've ever read in my life is this book called, I don't want to talk about it. Did we, did we talk about this in Hawaii? We must have. I think so. Yeah. By Terrence real. And he talks so much about the difference between covert and overt depression. So overt depression is what most people think about when they think of depression. It's the person who can't get out of bed, who's weepy, who's unmotivated, you know, overeating, undereating, you know, your classic picture of depression, the person who's sitting there morose in their psychiatrist's office or whatever. And then there's covert depression, which is the same underlying pain, but it manifests itself typically with addiction, anger, aggression, workaholism, you know, all sorts of other things that are numbing this sort of discomfort. And one of the statistics that Terry talks about in the book that just blew my mind, because it's so obvious when he says it, like I didn't think, I guess what I realized was, I can't believe I've never thought of this before, but he talks about the stark contrast between men and women. So when you look at, for example, what's the proportion of men in prison versus women in prison? It's something about, you know, it's like 93% of incarcerated people in the United States are men, not women. Rates of alcoholism, you know, it's about 20% in men. And, and again, I could be directionally, I could be a little bit off, but directionally it's, you know, it's about three to one in favor of men for alcohol abuse, obviously, you know, nine to one in prison, drug abuse, violence, all of these things are vastly more in men than in women. But when you look at women with clinical diagnosis of depression versus men with a clinical diagnosis of depression. It's the opposite. It's disproportionately men. And he goes through this exercise in his book of adding up the absolute numbers. What's the absolute number of women that are receiving therapy for depression, that have issues with alcohol, drugs, violence, et cetera, et cetera, do the same exercise for men. It turns out it's the same number. What's the difference? The difference is the form in which it exists. And this just sort of blew my mind, right? Which is all of this time, like, you know, whether it's you, me, I, I think this is my anger issue or this is my addiction or whatever it is. And you realize what's underpinning that is the same pain that in a woman might lead to depression that we will label in a certain way and we're not seeing it this way. And so, so kind of listening to your story is so interesting because I'm just sort of watching the arc of numbing vehicles to numb pain. If it's not this drug, it's the pursuit of this sport. And if it's not that, it's this fight, if it's this thing. And it's interesting, just, it sounds like the ayahuasca became, along with the psilocybin, became one of the first sets of tools, these plants 
that, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. So if I'm not right, no, please I'm, correct I'm nodding me. my head yes right now as you but, say all but, this. But it, it, it sounds like that was the first time when you finally saw through the bullshit of you're on a hedonic loop, a, a treadmill of one next fix after another. And again, it's so common in men, especially that like we're sort of drawn to using our body as a shield, right? Like the bigger and stronger and tougher you are, the more that seven-year-old is not going to hurt. Which, yeah. which again, when you say it that way, it sounds so stupid, but that's because we're now sitting here talking like, like it's a rational thought and not realizing that there's a wounded kid that had to come up with sort of a set of skills to adapt to a situation. And those adaptations were actually very positive. For the large part, they saved you, right? They prevented you probably from jumping off a balcony when you were seven, but they start to become maladaptive. And it's, it, to me, this is the stuff that's interesting is this transition from adaptive to maladaptive and it starts to come crashing down. Yeah, I mean, it peels back layers. They talk about the infinite onion every time you go. And that's, that's something, uh, that's something that really resonates with me. You listen to people like Dennis McKenna and Gabra Mate. People I find fascinating is that they've done hundreds of ceremonies and it's completely unique each time they go. And I say ceremony because of the respect and reverence that's used when they utilize these plants. But it's the fact that if I give enough space between ceremonies and I come back and have a reason to be there that's important to me, I'm going to get a lot that has to do with that and maybe even more than what I came for. And that peeling back at the layer really shows such a deep reflection of what's going on inside right now. And it also has shown me the ways that I behave due to how I was programmed. It just blows my mind. We just got back from Saltara. We did another four ayahuasca ceremonies there about three weeks ago. And each one just took me away. It took me to a different place. Again, they were completely unique from one another. And I continue to learn how to work with it. You know, it's continuing to evolve. And I listening to guys like Dennis, like that, that will continue on well past a hundred ceremonies. Have you had some really negative ones? Negative, and by negative, I yeah, want to caveat I'll, that by saying highly, highly unpleasant. Yeah. So I'll, I'll <laughs> happy to jump into this. One of the hardest nights of my life was in Colombia, and you know ayahuasca has a, a visual component where you can have quote unquote visions like in a, in a dreamlike state. Oftentimes, they're very personal what you see. There was a night where I had none of that and all of the purgative effects of ayahuasca. So I shit water violently, barely made it to the bathroom the entire night, didn't sleep one minute, puked violently the whole night. It was incredibly hard, but it was in many ways cleaning me out, and that's I think what I needed at that point. Now that's physiologically unbearable, but have you had, I mean, I've had one experience on ayahuasca that was emotionally unbearable. And I'm going to get right there. Yeah. 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 Those, so, those are the ones that interest me. <laughs> <laughs> Having had a, a night like that, generally speaking, for the most part, and I've done now 26 ceremonies with ayahuasca, there would be some level of back and forth. So if I had a really challenging time physically, I could purge and then I'd feel euphoria. If I had some challenge emotionally, maybe I'm reliving some hard memory from my past, I would see within the same time span, you know, within, I don't know, 30 minutes, that that other side of that coin and see the beauty in it and, and realize all the things that it gave me and understand it with a new perspective. My second to last night in Costa Rica recently at Sultara, was for sure the hardest night of my life. I had uh, my first dose early on and didn't feel a whole lot and it was very peaceful. And then I asked for a second dose and it was my intention for healing. And I remember asking, and then you can argue one way or another what, how much intention plays, plays a role in this. I think it plays a huge role. But I remember opening the door to any and all emotional and mental healing. And if there's anything left from my childhood, because... Now I'm 37. I've done a number of ceremonies with ayahuasca and even higher number with psilocybin and other MDMA, many things. And I've worked through a great deal of stuff with my childhood. So I didn't think there was a whole lot left. And I just asked, like, if there's anything remaining from my childhood, please show me. It was fucking everything. It was the entire night. I made it back to the room. The ceremony had ended and it kicked off into a whole second ceremony. And it was... um almost unbearable at many points. I remember just begging for mercy, like, please, I've seen enough. Let's, let's, we can run this back a different time. Like any trying to rationalize or, or beg for a way out. So I wouldn't have to keep seeing this and to, and to paint a, 
just a, a small picture of this. Sometimes if I was to have a vision, it's like watching from the third person or watching a movie and I can see from a different lens. This was like reliving it for the first time. Through it your was, lens? Through my lens. First person, like it was happening to me the exact same feelings I was feeling as a six or seven year old or 15 year old in that moment, all the fear of my father, my mom screaming at me an inch from my face and spit flying into my mouth. Things like just, it was, and it's so real, but it just kept going and going and going. And I realized, holy shit, like all that's still there. Finally, as the sun came up, I just kind of surrendered to it. And that's one of these cornerstones that I've learned through working with the plants is you're not in control. Or I'm not in control. Anytime I do these things, I can, I have some level of direction, but really what I'm being shown is for me. It's not happening to me. So the ability to surrender that and let go of trying to change it really helped. And then having a degree of gratitude for my parents, knowing they were doing the best they could with what they could at that time. And also seeing how hard it was for them growing up and then seeing my son, that's really where it shifted. So my, we have a four-year-old son named bear and seeing him and realizing like, that's where it ends. Like that's where it ends. We all want to do better for our kids than, than what we were given. And that applies to everything from finances to education, to what kind of person they become. But knowing that he will never experience what I experienced or what my dad experienced or my granddad experienced, that generational pain is going to be gone with him. And seeing that I had so much gratitude for him and just knowing like, oh, okay, this breaks here. Like that was really cool. And the second I thought that it all washed away and I felt euphoria and I felt gratitude. And I just, it was for sure the hardest night of my life and one of the most beautiful in the end by far. There's not much to add to that because it's funny. I, I had made a note on my page to kind of come back to this point. All I had written down was break cycle sun. Do you feel that part of your edge is gone as a result of this journey? Yeah. There was a fire that was in you before that was partially constructive, partially destructive. And you sort of were balancing those two things. There were moments when the destructive side was winning. And then there were moments when the, you know, constructive side is winning. But it's hard to look at most professional fighters and not realize how much pain, unfortunately, is at the root of why they're doing what they're doing. It's very difficult, I think, to put yourself in the position of getting in a ring and fighting. I know this because I did it. You've done it. You've done it professionally. I never did it professionally. There's so much pain that predisposes a person to be willing to do that. Now, I'm sure there are exceptions to this. I'm sure there were like people with the most wonderful childhoods who have ended up becoming fighters. But I used to study boxing at a level that <laughs> would, would border on me getting an honorary PhD for it. And I can't actually think of an example of a professional boxer that I'd studied who wasn't fueled by some awful thing that had happened to them. You know, it can be something little, but oftentimes it was not, right? Oftentimes it was generational and misery. Do you sort of feel a bit remote now from that sport in the way? I mean, I'm sure you still enjoy it, but do you also, I mean, is your relationship with it complicated as a result of this new insight or these these new insights? I mean, I'm I for sure have let go for a long time after retiring. I retired five years ago this month, actually. And I knew I wasn't going to fight again, but I still I loved the sport. I wanted to watch every fight, never missed a fight, trained. I didn't do striking because I knew that would lead me to fighting again, but I did a lot of jujitsu, competed in it a couple of times. And I think now I would call myself a casual fan. You know, I still have all the guys that I used to train with at AKA, I'll watch them when they fight. It's on ESPN a lot now, so I'll watch that too if it's on TV. But I don't like schedule stuff like, oh man, the so-and-so is fighting. I got to stop everything. You know, like if I catch it, great. If I don't, it's not a big deal to me. It didn't necessarily change the way I look at fighting. I have a lot of gratitude for what fighting gave me and what fighting taught me. And I feel very fortunate that I retired at 32 years old. And retired without the catastrophic injuries that many people leave with. Yeah, yeah. And that's huge. You know, I want to be able to read to my son and any, all of our children and then chase them around and play and, and be, be the dad I want to be, you know, but with, uh, with that chip on my shoulder. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Washed away. I mean, I remember when I first started fighting, I just wanted to, there's a, there's a line in fight club and forgive me if you've heard me talk about this before, but there's a line in fight club where Edward Norton's character beats the shit out of Jared Leto, the blonde guy. 
And Brad Pitt looks at Edward Norton. He says, what the fuck is wrong with you? And he just says, I just wanted to destroy something beautiful. And that's it. Like that resonated with me. I wanted to beat the shit out of people. And over time that shifted to, I just want to be the best version of myself. And then now I, I see that still being the case, but it's from a much different lens. Like what being the best version of myself is applies to so many more things outside of athleticism. And I think that's a likely transition for people who have started to age and whatever, you know, there's sure there's a lot of older people like, Oh, you haven't aged or 37, but I feel different than when I was 27. Sure. No I mean, doubt. 37 year old athletes, an old athlete. So you're not even halfway done life. And yet the last four or five years have probably been some of the most important, not that it's necessarily productive or constructive. Do you ever ask yourself the question, like, what do you think you'd be doing right now if you hadn't had this fortuitous set of events, meeting the right boxing coach, being introduced to the plant medicine and being able to sort of extract from it what it gives you. Cause I don't think the plants aren't neat. <laughs> they, don't, they don't give you little turnkey, just take this. It's all okay. It's really messy. It's really messy work. And it's as much about the work you do before and after as it is what you do in, under the direct influence of the plant. But but if you hadn't been as lucky as you've been to experience that, I mean, what's a 37-year-old former UFC fighter doing who hasn't worked through the issues you had? Because there's a lot of those guys out there. I mean, I don't, I'm, this isn't about the UFC. This is like maybe someone who's never thrown a punch in their life, but they're still suffering from the same pain. Yeah, a lot of, I mean, I think the the cliche thing to say is dead or in jail. I don't think that applies to me. I think I really turned the corner, but I wouldn't say it's far-fetched to think that I'd still be fighting in some low-level show, getting the shit kicked out of me, losing brain cells. I for sure wouldn't be with Natasha, my wife. I mean, in many ways, we were together for about a year before we did ayahuasca for the first time. And it, like that changed the course of our relationship. It unpacked so much of the arguing that we had allowed me to see things in myself that she could, but I could not and vice versa. As we grew as individuals, we grew together in our relationship and there's no way that would have worked out had I just continued to fight and treat myself the way that I was, you know? And so I think that's, that's a pretty, if I look at probabilities, that's probably the, probably the highest probability is that I'd still be fighting somewhere making peanuts and taking my and getting lungs. hurt. Yeah, getting hurt regularly. How does all this sort of shape the way you think about raising your son? Because you, you alluded to the most important point a moment ago, which is, if nothing else, the cycle of pain and, the, and, and shame and trauma and all that stuff, at least it stops with, with you now to bear. But what else do you think about as far as like, because now it's beyond not just having him be hurt, but showing him something. That yeah. Maybe... What can I give him, you know, in the world? And I think a lot of things fascinate me. People talk shit about the paleo diet and that's fine. And, and what did paleo man actually eat and all that? And, and yeah, I get it. I get it from both sides, but to think through the lens of how our ancestors lived, that fascinates me. This is a huge, giant test and it's a huge test of what we're doing now for, with everything that's in the modern world. It's being done for the very first time. What are the ways that we can kind of reconnect to our roots and still live in the modern world? And I think when I think about things like that, what are the, the most important pieces that I've learned and what are the most important pieces that I'm learning about now? I want him to have some degree of confidence. And I think martial arts is really good for that. I don't necessarily want him to fight, but that's his decision. And it'll always be his decision. Even if he says, fuck martial arts, I want to play piano. And that's totally cool. I have to let go of that. But still giving him the ability to, to try all these things and see what he enjoys. He loves, I mean... He's athletic. Both me, me and my wife are both uh, athletes, so that's not confusing to me. But you know, he's he's doing jujitsu now. It's pretty early, but it's kind of the equivalent of tumbling or gymnastics, and he absolutely loves it. And he, our wrestle time is probably the most fun. You know, we have a hundred square feet of MMA mats in our living room, so we can do yoga, we can roll, we can do whatever, and and roughhouse, and and we can play soccer or frisbee or, and those are all things that he loves, but he doesn't love anything as much as wrestling me. So like, and getting him into jujitsu now, it's, um, it's pretty cool to see that. I don't know how long that's going to last. It really doesn't matter. Getting back to this ancestral stuff. I think it's critical that we at least try to find some rite of passage, especially for our young men to bring them into adulthood. And I think that Ben Greenfield's buddy, Tim Corcoran, He's doing a lot of good stuff. He has these wilderness survival camps for father and son. 
when the kids are old enough, he takes them out there and they're, they, they're solo, you know, or they're in a small group and it's just him kind of watching over. And they, they learn how to build fires. They learn how to feel safe in the environment. They learn how to forage for wild mushrooms and different things that they can survive on. And I think that's an incredible piece, taking it a step further. And again, if we're having that conversation with the DEA sitting on the couch, I don't know that I'd say this, but I think it's it's a very strong likelihood that I'll be taking him to the Amazon or, or maybe not me, maybe Uncle Aubrey will or somebody else. Because oftentimes that was the case in Rite of Passage. Your, the kids would have to leave their parents and go off with the elders, the aunties, the uncles, and go through their work. And I think um, having a close uncle like that, who also has experience with these things, taking him to the Amazon for a Rite of Passage with something like ayahuasca would be really transformative and powerful for him. And to most people hearing about this for the first time, they're going to be like, that's fucking nonsense. Like that, <laughs> you're right, you lost me here. But I know quite a few people who are some of the most beautiful humans I've ever met that did that. Parangi being one of them. He's uh, an incredible musician, one of the most kind-hearted people I've ever met. And he, his first ceremony was when he was 11. So it's not to say that happens for everyone, but again, if you understand set and setting and, and who are really good practitioners, and that's something I say a lot of times is, there's black belts and there's white belts in martial arts. There's black belts teaching ayahuasca and white belts teaching. And there's everything in between. And some people spend a week in the Amazon and come back and say, oh, I'm going to give this to all my friends and everyone I know. And it can have really bad consequences from that. So, you know, having a place that, that has been vetted, at least by somebody you respect and know, I think is critical when it comes to these things. Because as Aubrey says, you're performing psychic surgery. And that done incorrectly can leave some really lasting damage. But correctly, it can be everything that I see in it, everything that Dennis sees in it. Yeah, and and anyone listening to this who has not yet read Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind, to have such a great storyteller and a great writer take on such an important topic, I think it's hard to come away from that without realizing that there's there's a lot here that we need to understand better, but the, the promise is enormous. Yeah, yeah, and we, we do need to understand it better, there's no doubt. Under those circumstances, I think I can give to him a lot of things. I, you remember being in high school thinking, and maybe you didn't because you had boxing, but I remember being in high school thinking like nothing is more important than this, than how I'm perceived by my peers, status, things like that, popularity, who my friends are, what kind of girl I'm going to date. And like when the world ends I went gra upon graduation day, what am I going to do? And th those kind of things. And there's a lot of weight and heaviness to that environment especially now when you see kids that are glued to their iPad and you got eight year olds with cell phones and things like that. It's, it's really hard to get them to unplug and to see the big picture. And I think, um, I think a medicine like that could be really important to reconnect them to what matters and to get them to see with a wider lens to things that matter to them at that point in time. I think it could be a great tool for young people. It's amazing. How has your relationship come full circle with your parents? I mean, is it, is it just this incredible place of forgiveness? Is it still difficult? It's funny you say that because right after this ceremony or a series of ceremonies in at Sultara in Costa Rica, my wife and I flew back to the Bay Area where our son's being watched by my family. And then we all flew out to Puerto Vallarta for a family vacation. And there's a famous quote from Terrence, I think it's Terrence McKenna. No, it's Ram Dass, where if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, fuck, man, I went from one ceremony to the next. And it came with its own set of challenges, for sure. But as far as my relationship goes, I have a great deal of compassion for them. I've also learned from the medicines that everyone walks their own path. It's not up for me to decide how or when they should learn their lessons. And just as it was the case with me and my wife, I can't always see what's going on where I'm, where I'm fucking up. Everyone has a blind spot. So somebody that's close to you might be able to see what's going on in you better than you can. And it certainly was the case in my relationship. And I can see all the faults that my parents have that they don't see, but it's not up to me to decide that they will learn their own lessons at their own pace. And they may go to the grave without having learned some lessons. That's okay. I'm for sure going to do the same thing. But that compassion, to me, that's one of the most powerful parts of the story is to feel and experience empathy for another person who may have indirectly or directly hurt you. Yeah. And to realize, wow, they didn't mean to hurt me, or even if they did mean to hurt me, which is not the case, I think, in your situation, but 
this is the set of circumstances for them. And that sounds crazy, right? That sounds like we should accept, you know, horrible things that people have done to us. But in reality, what's your choice? <laughs> yeah. And, and something that I've gathered too is forgiveness has very little to do with the person I'm forgiving. It has everything to do with taking that fucking weighted vest off of me because I'm held down by that. Whatever anger or pain or resentment that I feel towards another person, the longer I hold on to that, they might not even fucking know. It might not be on their radar, but I'm keeping that in me and it's affecting the way that I go through the world. So if I can release that, what greater gift can I give to myself, let alone the other person I'm forgiving? Well, I want to thank you for being, you know, so open about such difficult topics. There were a whole bunch of other things I thought we were going to talk about that were super nerdy and sciencey and stuff, but I get to talk about that stuff all the time. This was, uh, I thought this was far more interesting, far more valuable. And I honestly, I think more people will, will, will find this resonant. So I really appreciate it, man. Awesome, brother. Thanks for having me. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. Happy Father's Day, brother. You can find all of this information and more at peteratiamd.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find the show notes, readings, and links related to this episode. You can also find my blog at peteratiamd.com. Maybe the simplest thing to do is to sign up for my subjectively non-lame once-a-week email where I'll update you on what I've been up to, the most interesting papers I've read, and all things related to longevity, science, performance, sleep, etc. On social, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID peteratiamd. But usually Twitter is the best way to reach me to share your questions and comments. Now for the obligatory disclaimer. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical advice. And note, no doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to the podcast is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures, the companies I invest in and or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about.